Hello and welcome to Digest This, where we discuss clinical topics in gastroenterology. Today we are discussing pancreatic cancer and precision medicine. My name is Francesca Moroni and I'm one of the gastroenterology consultants in the north of Scotland. And I am delighted to introduce today Mr. Nigel Jamieson, a CR clinical scientist in Glasgow and an hepatobiliary pancreatic surgeon at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Welcome Mr. Jamieson, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it was nice to be here, I really appreciate you asking me to, to help with this. Before we emerge ourselves in this very interesting topic, I wonder if we could set a bit of the scene about pancreatic cancer and what challenging does this pose to the clinician? Okay, um, I know I, I, for me this is a, a topic I feel very strongly about and it's really it's, it's good to have an opportunity to help raise awareness and, and to provide information for consultant colleagues and trainees on this topic. So for me, pancreatic cancer is an increasing problem and unfortunately will become the second leading cause of cancer related death over the next decade. And so it's, it's really important that we, we raise awareness and, and really help pay, people understand how better to uh, diagnose and, and really come to terms with the, the gravity of the problem. Unfortunately, most of our patients present late and they present with metastatic disease and such that 40% of patients will, 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 will present in that setting with disease that spread beyond the pancreas. For another 40% of patients, the tumour, although localised to the pancreas, is involving major blood vessels and that makes it very difficult for an operation to be formed. And so we're only left with 10 to 15% of patients with what we call resectable pancreatic cancer. Um, and so this, this creates multiple challenges. Um, the, for those patients with metastatic disease at presentation, this life expectancy is, is as short as six months. And the overall life expectancy for all patients with this disease is, is remains unchanged over 50 years and is still is as low as in this country as 5% at five years. And so it's, it's, a, it's a really challenging situation that we need to work hard to improve. Absolutely. And at the moment uh, in a patient journey, what sort of treatment we have available and above all, are we operating the right people? Um, it, you know, the, 20 years ago, there really wasn't any effective therapy for pancreatic cancer, and that was it was a really difficult period. Over the last decade, there had been some really big paradigm shifts in the in the chemotherapy available for patients with metastatic cancer, and, and, and it improved the, the combination of fulfurinox chemotherapy, which is four drugs in combination with. Uh, for some patients who were fit enough to tolerate it, improved survival from six months uh, to, to 12 months. And that, that made a big, big impact and helped break down the nihilism associated with treating this disease. We saw incremental benefits with other combination therapies like gemabraxane that improve with less complications, still improved survival from six to nine months. And then we saw a really big breakthrough where that fulfurinox regime giving adjuvantly after the patient had, had their, their operation, we, we then saw a, almost a breakthrough in terms of seeing up to 50% of patients still alive at five years in that trial. And that was a radically different scenario we'd never thought we would see 20 years ago. But the problem with that is that not all patients respond. That was a really select group of patients in that trial. And so what we have to do is sort of disentangle that, that really positive message, but try to, to use that to, to, to treat all patients better. And that's, that's kind of the challenge, I would say, for pancreas cancer at the moment. So is this where precision medicine to come into play? Yeah, I, I would say a little bit because I think what what we're what we're trying to do, and I think precision medicine is a huge term, and you know I think it's it's in what does it mean, and I think it it, it means, for me, it's just trying to almost you know that's um, to disentangle and to to account for variability in any disease, and whether that's a gastroenterology disease or whether that's um, or whether that's uh, you know deciding which patient gets the right blood transfusion 
for me that's also precision medicine, or what we maybe think of as precision oncology, which is what we're talking about today, where we would maybe target a drug to a particular patient's um, uh, molecular um, uh, weakness in that tumour. Um, but at the same time, we even, even in the setting before we get to that in pancreas cancer, we would, we would, we, we currently do look at um, say the DYD um, phenotype of a patient because that that in information tells us will that patient metabolize f the chemotherapy 5-FU properly. If we don't do that, the patient if we don't find that out early, the patient might get really bad side effects and stop their chemotherapy. So we're already doing just we already select patients based on some genetic features. Um, but yeah, I think I think for for you know taking that trial information. Um, and then trying to, to apply that to more patients in a, in a targeted and precise way is, is where we want to go. Now, maybe pancreas cancer is a hard disease to, to, to undertake precision oncology or precision medicine with. We've seen lots of success already in other cancer types. We've seen for decades, in fact, breast cancer treated in a precise targeted oncology method through oestrogen, in, in giving oestrogen blocking agents if the if the tumour's oestrogen positive receptor status, giving Herceptin if the patient has HER2 positivity. So everybody will be comfortable with that. And then we saw Herceptin being used in gastric cancer in the similar circumstance. And then more recently we've seen lung cancer patients who have a mutation in EGFR gene targeted with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And then lung cancer again has had lots of success in melanoma through targeting immunotherapy to patients that have high expression of uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So we're seeing incremental gains and across lots of cancer types. And I always go back to you know the story of the um, the gastrointestinal stromal tumours. Their tar their CKIP mutation allows them to be very easily targeted effectively by Gleevec, which, uh, which came from CML and uh, you know, BCR able mutation. But pancreas cancer is unfortunately, although we're talking about it today, is, is a really difficult one because it's it's much more heterogeneous. Uh, there there's 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 not a big driver mutation. Uh, there's lots of smaller mutations and it's really trying to see if we can identify those patients that might respond to that platinum chemotherapy, to that fall furinox chemotherapy regime that I kind of um, alluded to earlier being effective. Can we identify those patients uh, early? And we kind of have it. We have a strategy potentially, and it builds upon uh, knowing that patients with BRCA mutations uh, are susceptible to platinum chemotherapy, and we know that from breast cancer. We know that from ovarian cancer. And we know those there's familial clusters of patients with brachia mutations that develop all of those cancers, and so we try we're trying to treat them similarly, and we're able to expand the the group of patients that we would would be on just patients with brachia mutation to those with um, almost the the network of genes or that brachia ness signature that might benefit from platinum chemotherapy. Very interesting indeed. Is uh, BRCA genes are quite um, popular in common knowledge, even amongst gastroenterologists, uh, probably from the publicised and throughout the world. And you know, we are aware in certain countries there are already surveillance programmes for these patients. What do you think is the role of that in pancreatic cancer? I think you know, as part of what we're we're you know, we'll maybe talk a bit about with Precision Pank. You know, we 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 see the benefit of trying to to undertake um, in, um, almost a early molecular testing in these patients to find as much about these tumours as possible. And so far, you know, we feel passionately that's the right thing to do. And in, in, and in, we see this already in North America where a germline mutation testing is almost, is now essentially standard of care in certain institutions such that a, a, a panel of, of 
BRCA genes and other risk factor genes for pancreas cancer are measured and screened for to provide information for that patient but also for their extended family and so I think we, we would definitely uh, you know we would but in the UK I think at the moment outside of a trial um, it, there's there's still not the the the, um, the, the, the the, the, the support for that being done as standard but I think with time that will come and with time as we can show that these patients benefit potentially from being a, a, having specific therapies targeting a BRCA and, and that comes with the new studies that have come out showing that Alaparib which is another drug which targets BRCA, a PARP inhibitor, has been shown in the second line setting as a maintenance therapy to prolong survival. So we've now got you know, FDA approved drugs which can provide another layer of uh, options for patients. Um, in terms of other options for screening, I think it's important to think about other known risk factors for pancreatic cancer. Um, we know that chronic pancreatitis can lead to pancreatic cancer. This is a difficult group of patients to look after. Often it's the, trying to disentangle smoking and alcohol, both risk factors for pancreas cancer from, from chronic inflammation in the pancreas is challenging. But it's a group of patients we need to be aware that they are at much higher risk of developing pancreas cancer. We also have to think about pancreatic pre-malignant cystic neoplasms, IPMNs, MCNs, they're a big burden in our radiology department and our MDTs and we need to think carefully how to achieve a sort of realistic medicine option for how to monitor them uh, so that we don't miss cancers developing in these cysts but also not um, over investigate patients that will never be candidates for, for, for operation so I think that, that's a difficult balance and through trials, guidelines, international consensus, we'll hopefully get there. The other group that I think is important to mention is is through the, the work of the Liverpool group, uh, who did so much work in screening with Europac, which is their familial pancreatic cancer studies. They're, they're now looking at new onset diabetes in, in patients kind of over 50. And that's you know a, an important study funded by CRUK that's looking to help guide you know, when do we investigate that patient who maybe isn't a typical type 2 diabetic, who's maybe slim, who then loses a bit of weight, who develops diabetes, could that be a pancreas cancer? And that's, that's a challenge as well because um, CTs are not perfect, MRIs are not perfect, so even it's, the, it's trying to establish what's, what's the right test to do in that patient in order to, 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 to study that group of patients and also to maybe find a biomarker for early pancreatic cancer detection, so. That's really interesting here it is uh, run through the target uh, for treatment, but also the early detection. So I understand that the role of pancreatic medicine is not just on targeting treatment, but also improving detection of cancer, which we find quite challenging in pancreatic cancer. And talking through this, uh, you mentioned earlier on about uh, precision punk, and I know you're leading a lab group for the bits and for this. Would you like us to tell us something about it? Yeah, I, I suppose I've touched on that a little bit, but I think you know where precision punk came from was from the work of Andrew Biankin, David Chang, um, and and others in Australia who came over to Glasgow in sort of the, the you know 2014, 2015, and and really generated a wealth of new information led by a consort, you know, part as they were part of a consortium, they were part of ICGC, International Cancer Gen Genomics Consortium. They were part of the Australian Pancreatic uh, Genomics Institute that were investigating pancreatic cancer. And we found so much more out about the mutational profiles, about the frequency of mutations, about the, the transcriptomic profiles and the different subtypes of pancreatic cancer at a gene expression level. And that really, you know, cemented our understanding that there's, you know, that although they look the same down the microscope, often these pancreatic cancers at a molecular level can be quite different. And one of the groups we, we, we've referred to is the squamous tumours, 
versus the classical pancreas cancers. The squamous cancers uh, have um, what we call epithelial mesenchymal transition changes. They, they're more aggressive, they're less responsive to chemotherapy, they spread to different sites in the body. And so we've got all of this information and that was when you know Precision Pan came about, about trying to then say, can we in a, in a clinical trial fashion take uh, biopsies from patients, take blood samples from patients, such that we know this information at the start of the patient's journey and not just at the end when they've had an operation. And can we get this information from all of our patients with pancreas cancer, not just those good performing ones that get an operation and, and really sort of take those and, and, and then, and so learn from, from our patients, but then use that information we learn to help guide the therapies they would be on, but also have the, the learning we get from the first kind of cohort of patients help us provide information for the next trials and it would always be kind of circular. And and these sort of um, these sort of master protocol trials are incredibly difficult to organise and requires buy in from all sorts of the of the of the community. It, all sites because we're going to need more than one centre, so we have to have multi-centre. We were asking a lot because we were asking patient centres to do things they'd never done before. You know, um, make endoscopy ultrasound biopsy much more kind of common and and and, and, and protocolised in terms of their handling the same sort of paraffin bedding, so that we could do the same genomic testing and in in, in Glasgow and, and standardise these aspects of it. And a lot of people didn't believe that would be possible. They thought you can't get much information from an endoscopic biopsy, but we kind of had to provide the evidence that you could. And people bought in, and then you know that's been running for the last three or four years, and we've been running trials in the mainstay in metastatic cancer, and and we've but we've also done a new adjuvant trial as well, um, and that's you know it's, it's it's been a huge amount of work, and at the moment you know David Chang's been you know has been really driving that forward, and has managed to you know generate further trials. So now that we're at a point where we've got immunotherapy trials starting soon, we've got targeted therapy trials started soon, we've got locally advanced trials starting soon through collaborations in, in London with Hemant Koster, he's leading start uh, Precision Bank, um, sorry, Primus 005. So we've, you know, um, but at the same time, it's, it's been a lot of work and um, I think people's expectation is that there would be a solution already. And in realistic, I think that was never, you know, from the people at the core of it, it was more about this is just the platform, this is the initial phase. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's, 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 it's we've, we've already, we've learned a lot, but we've, I think we've also learned how difficult it really is to do these, these trials. Sounds extremely challenging from an organisational point of view, but also I would say clinically <coughs> recruiting patients for trials on cancer, specifically on pancreatic cancer, may be very difficult. It, it, it's really difficult and I think it's I think that's you know one of the aspects, you know, you know, some you know, I think it's at the same time as is 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 being aware that we want to treat patients with targeted therapies. We want to achieve these phenomenally good outcomes, but at the same time what we what we what we have to do here and now is make sure that all our patients have a good journey. And actually one of the benefits of Precision Pank is that it actually made you look at the journey in a, in a, in a lot of detail. It, you, it made you actually get the endoscopic ultrasound biopsy reported faster to enable the molecular testing to be done. So actually there was benefits from the whole, everyone benefited in, in terms of the technical aspect of diagnosing. But we also had to think about making sure are all our patients on you know, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy so that they don't lose weight, so that they're fit enough to stay on the trial. Are they all seeing dietitians to make sure their nutritional status is good enough to maintain their weight, to make sure they're good enough for the trials? So actually there's the, the, the sort of, the halo effect of having the trial has then helped us focus on, on all aspects of that. And I think ultimately that's the most important part because most of the patients are not ever going to get to these difficult or get to these targeted therapy steps. Another spin-off of it was something that was was looking at the radiology aspect of it um, in terms of making sure that we were talking the same language amongst the different institutions about um, 
the stage of the disease, the stage of the primary tumour specifically, how, how uh, closely aligned it was with the blood vessels um, um, w in terms of the lymph nodes being involved and that nomenclature and trying to create a common language it, it was is, is kind of been turned into a, a template reporting f form for the for the which has been badged by the Royal College of Radiologists and the Royal College of Surgeons and that's something we're also rolling out at the moment across the UK so I think precision you know medicine for pancreas cancer is is all of those all of those things you know not just giving drugs this is so refreshing to hear because often we feel like academic world in medicine is so distant from clinical medicine but actually this is what making us progress even in the day-to-day -day practice and what we can do today to improve patients outcomes i think so and i think you know for us you know you know, I think this is what you know. I think there's always you get locked into your silo, and you then you realise well, actually a lot of these things are happening already in lung cancer. You know, there's molecular MDT aspects to lung cancer MDTs, and so and but for us now we are doing a molecular MDT, which is a bit staggered. It doesn't it doesn't affect the patient's day to day management, but allows us every few months to look at oh look at these interesting cases, look at these mutations, you know, how do we how you know, how could that patient benefit from access to another trial based on what that information we now know about it. And so it, it the, the the worlds of academia and just looking at mutational profiles and the patients are, are you know bot you know bottom down, you know, top down, bottom up are, are starting to meet in the middle. So and where do you see the future of pancreatic precision medicine going? Yeah, I think I think it, it, a lot of the you know those I think it, on the you know I think it has to be first and foremost improving the patient's journey, and and that's happening in combination with the the, the, the charities. I think Pancreatic Cancer UK, Pancreatic Scotland, they're they're working really hard to 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 get that you know early detection aspect, making people aware of symptoms, you know weight loss, jaundice change in bowel habit, seek attention from your GP as soon as possible because ultimately if we find patients sooner then there's more options and I think that's probably the most important aspect of anything we can do um, and then on top of that is once there's a diagnosis making sure that we have standardisation almost of how we diagnose the patients, radiology reporting, initial treatment with pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy and nutrition, that's our bedrock and then we build on that and then ultimately for me, ultimately, as a surgeon, I want to be doing less operating because ultimately that probably means we're doing more operations in the right people. And I think that has always been kind of my ambition for this. And, um, and, and that may mean that for some patients, we've let, we find out early that an operation is not the right thing to do because their biology is very bad. That's very interesting. There's anything else that you foresee in the future that can improve patients' outcomes? I think we just have to, we have to continue the learning process, and I think the only way we can do that is by you know um, working together across the United Kingdom to build on the precision bank concept and think about recruiting as many patients as possible into clinical trials at all aspects of the d disease, whether that's early stage disease, late stage disease. Um, I think that that's that has to be something that we we continue to to, to do. Um, and again, you know, as a you know, as a surgeon, I think you know things that will possibly affect me within my career will be increasing use of say robot robot assisted platform surgery. I think that will will be another aspect of how we can you know you know ultimately be more precise in how and how we deliver surgical care, um, and that we're seeing impacts in that in colorectal cancer and gin oncology, and it will come to. To, to to HPB as well. Of course, uh, this is a very complex condition that involves the, the intervention of a lot of specialty dietetics, radiology that you mentioned. So, what can the gastroenterology do to help through this? I think you know, it's, you know, I think ultimately it is a real team sport, as we call it, um, and you know, the the gastroenterologists, you know, from from you know, you know, impact in multiple ways because I think you know we have. You know the diagnostic dilemma of say autoimmune pancreatitis you know something like that where we have to rely so much on your expertise at picking up you know these sur surrogate features that might give us a steer away from this being this tumor 
you know, actually not being a cancer, but actually being an inflammatory condition, you know, having the, you know, the, mm, the, the, the strength of character to give steroids in that situation and seeing that get better. I think, you know, these are, you know, so I think, you know, I often, you know, have to think that's, we, we need these medical experts in that aspect of it. For me, you know, I, you know, I'm not an endoscopist at all, some of my colleagues are, and I think, you know, for me, I think gastroenterologists pushing the boundaries of what can be performed endoscopically is vital to, 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 for both interventional and diagnostic aspects of endoscopic ultrasound or ERCP. You know, I, I, you know, I go to North America and you see patients getting, you know, wall-opposing stents as a ballot, as a a palliative bypass procedure to save them having to have even a laparoscopic gastrojejunostomy. So I think you know these are these are the you know where where gastroenterologists can really you know um, increase the options for these patients. And I think at the same time is probably from, from what I said today and what I spoke about earlier in terms of endoscopic ultrasound biopsy. That's the it's it's an absolutely key component to any future trials molecular characterization of this, and that means that you know. You need to, you know, you know that you need a team of gastroenterologists. You need a, people learning EUS, being trained well, so that they are getting, you know, as close to 100% positivity in their biopsy pickup, and being confident that putting the extra needle core or using the bigger FNB needle is advantageous to the patient. And it's not just about diagnosis; it's about, you know, a molecular diagnosis in these patients. So, you know, if that's, and I think also the, the kind of outside of the MDT, just being able to pick up the phone and saying, I've been asked to put a stent in this patient in the periphery, is that what you guys want us to do in a, maybe a central hospital? Because ultimately, I will, you know, if I get the opportunity to look at the scan, so actually I've seen the scan, I say, no, they actually just transfer the patient to me and they'd be better off having a Whipple because the risk of, you know, ERCP pancreatitis in that setting is, is, not, is, not, is not going to be helpful to the patient. We just need to think about, a, you know, a fast track uh, pancreatic resection. So I think building a team, you know, to talk about you know the cases on an MDT setting, but also having a network that you can you can you know contact uh, the surgeons, you know, with without having to go through an MDT is really important as well. Absolutely, that's a very fascinating topic, and I completely agree with the teamwork. And I really like the analogy of a team sport. Well, all is left for me to say is to thank you for an excellent run through to this very fascinating topic. Thank you very much. And to thank you for joining us for Digest This.